Good evening. Thank you for coming out tonight. My name is Merwin Chambers. I am treasurer of the Friends of the Gwinnett County Public Library. If you're not a current member, I would encourage you to join. I'll be happy to talk to you after the program's over if you're interested. The author's books will be for sale and signing thanks to our independent bookstore partner, Eagle Eye Bookshop. We thank Eagle Eye for their support and encourage you to support them through purchasing a book. And I'm happy to say that their 20th anniversary is coming up on Saturday the 29th. They will be part of the, uh, the, the book, independent booksellers celebration and, and the booksellers crawl. So you can pick up one of these brochures from them also. This program, as you can see, is being filmed and it'll be available on the library's YouTube channel in a few weeks. Greg Bluestein is a political reporter who covers state politics for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. He also contributes to the Political Insider blog and Jolt newsletter, hosts Politically Georgia podcast, and co-hosts shows on WSB and Georgia Public Broadcasting. Greg is a frequent guest on local and national TV and radio programs. He's a graduate of the University of Georgia with degrees in journalism and political science. Greg will be speaking about his book, Flipped, how Georgia turned purple and broke the monopoly on Republican powers. Please join me in welcoming Greg Bluestein to the office. Well, thank you so much. Can everyone hear me okay? Uh, it's such an honor to be here and to see such a warm welcome. Um, I, so I don't have a fancy PowerPoint presentation. Instead, I'm going to talk about 20, 25 minutes um, about my book, about what I've experienced, and then I'd love to hear your questions because so much has happened since this book published um, around, around, it was around this time last year, and it was mostly finished in late 2021, so it was before last year's primary, of course, before the general election and before the run-up to 2024 um, election. I've had the honor of covering Georgia politics now for the last 20 or so years. I'm 40 years old, but I've covered this for more than half my life. My dream, I, I grew up right down the street in Sandy Springs, and I've wanted to be a journalist since I was in the fourth grade when I went to my teacher's class at, uh, at what is now called the AJA, the Atlanta Jewish Academy, and one of the guest speakers was uh, I.J. Rosenberg. He was the Braves beat reporter for the AJC, and back then it was the Braves' worst to first season. And so, <laughs> that was a long time ago. And so what I.J., I don't remember what I.J. said, I don't remember what lessons he imparted upon us, uh, I just remember going home and telling my mom that I wanted to be a newspaper reporter like I.J. And my mom, when her jaw <laughs> undropped, she wanted me to be a doctor. And like so many other people in my family, uh, or a lawyer, or some some of that something in that profession, and she ha she warned me. She goes, "To be a reporter, you've got to learn how to type." And at that point, our computer was some big behemoth in the basement that was scary and forbidding. And so I said, "I'll do something easier. I will be a doctor." <laughs> so, so for the next ten years, I tried to be a doctor. I took all the AP classes, the AP physics classes and chemistry classes at North Springs High School over in North Fulton County. It was horrible at them. My sophomore, no, it was my junior year. My best friend's name was Jessica Schiffman, and her father worked as a producer at CNM. And I was over at her house one night um, after cross country practice, and we were hanging out watching MTV, and I was just avoiding going home and doing my homework. And her dad comes bustling in the basement, kind of wild eyed. It was an all hands on deck moment at CNN. This was 1998, and Kosovo had been bombed by the Russians. And at that point, uh, everyone thought that or there was a worry that that would uh, incite a bigger conflict, a wider conflict, and that it could be the start of World War III. And so uh, all hands on, were on deck at CNN, and Jim Schiffman was his name, said, hey, Jessica, Greg, do you want to come with me? Jessica rolled her eyes, said, Dad, leave us alone. I said, I'm all in, let's go. <laughs> so I went, and my, and my love for journalism that night was rekindled. But I always say it goes to show you just what little moments, you know, what little which, things with, you know, we think might be a small impact can have on a, on a student, on a teenager, um, because those two moments literally changed my life. And I, again, I, I remember going to CNN and being stuck in a break room and, you know, Jessica's dad didn't come back for three or four more hours to take us home. But I, I went home and I said, I want to join the North Springs High School Oracle 
I want to be a journalist. And I quickly joined the Oracle. Um, right after that, I went to UGA after graduating. And one of the first things I did was join the Red and Black, the stu independent student newspaper, which at that time was a daily newspaper. And it was my segue into journalism. And one of my first stories that I covered was in 2002. Um, I was the political reporter for the Red and Black. And I was covering local elections. And uh, one of my first beats was covering uh, a little known construction worker uh, who um, was running for state senate. He had a real uphill battle because back then, and as it is still now, Athens is a Democratic stronghold. And, but back then, the difference was that Democrats ruled the state. Democrats controlled the state senate. Um, they controlled the state house. Um, they controlled at that moment in 2002 the governor's office as well, although that election was about to happen. This was, you know, September. Um, and so I covered this guy who was running this uphill battle. His name is Brian Kemp. <laughs> and uh, he ended up defeating an entrenched incumbent uh, named Doug Haynes, who uh, was, going, was the party favorite. And uh, one of his closest allies was a guy named Sonny Perdue, who is now his chancellor of higher education. And of course, there, Sonny Perdue is the reason why Governor Kemp is even where he is, because Sonny Perdue would later appoint Governor Kemp to be Secretary of State and kind of you know, jumpstart his political future. Um, so all those years ago, 21 years ago, I covered Kemp's first run for office. Um, and I've had a front row Georgia politics that has been incredible. Um, I've known Stacey Abrams since she was a backbench uh, uh, minority leader of the state Democratic Party in, in the Georgia House. Um, I've known David Perdue since he was Sonny Perdue's little known cousin and in 2013 or so he called and said he's going to run for U.S. Senate and we said who are you again you know we know your cousin um, but we don't know you. Um, I've known Senator Warnock now um, since he got to Atlanta as the pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church and he was arrested at the state capitol back in 2014. I think that was one of my first major events with him. Uh, he was protesting the Republican refusal to expand Medicaid. Um, and I've known John Ossoff since 2017 when he called me up after I was visiting a friend down the road at the, at, at the Gwinnett Hospital. Um, and I got a phone call from an unknown number, picked it up, and it was Ossoff. And he said, hey, my name is John Ossoff. I'm running for Congress. And I said, join the club. There was already 20 or so people running for the 6th District. But he said, I've got something they don't have. I've got $250,000 in cash commitments, which at the time was a huge number. That race ended up costing $30 million. So in hindsight, it wasn't that big of a number, but back then it was. And he said, I have endorsements from Hank Johnson and John Lewis. And that started... Uh, that, that kind of was John uh, Ossoff's introduction to Georgia politics. And of course, that race was the race that really cemented Georgia as the battleground state it is today. Because if you think back to 2014, to 2010, to 2012, you know, uh, most of the races earlier in that decade, and of course, since Sonny Perdue's victory in 2002, uh, Georgia was, of course, very important to us and, 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 and was a huge state story. But it was not a national story. Um, in 2014, there'd be events on the campaign trail doing Governor Deal's re-election campaign against Jason Carter, where there might be one or two reporters. I was one of them, but there might be one or two reporters at major campaign events. Uh, in 2016, if you recall, neither Donald Trump nor Hillary Clinton even visited Georgia after they locked up their nominations. Georgia was such an afterthought. It was, it was not a surprise whatsoever that Donald Trump won Georgia by about, it, what was a surprise is he won it by five points. Everyone thought he would win it by eight or nine, but it wasn't a surprise he carried Georgia. Um, what was the other big surprise in that race was that he lost the suburbs. He lost Gwinnett County, of course. He lost Cobb County. He lost Henry County. That was the beginning of the suburban shift that we still see shaping Georgia politics today in a major way. But it's 2017 when I got that call from Ossoff and that race really started picking up um, where Democrats thought that the sub suburban battlegrounds, like that's what was then the 6th District, now the 6th District has been redrawn, but what was then the 6th District, which spanned from East Cobb uh, through North Fulton to North DeKalb, um, those are areas that Republicans drew to be very safe GOP headquarters, um, to never really be competitive. And then Donald Trump's presidency, his candidacy, and, and other, other reasons, shifting demographics. Um, a lot of uh, folks from New England and, and other blue areas were moving to that area. Um, and some other factors made the 6th District race sort of the, um, the, the ground zero for Georgia's changing politics. Of course, John Ossoff lost that race um, by about a point and a half to Karen Handel. But that started 
a bigger transition. And not long after he lost that race, he called me up and said, hey, I'm, I'm going to go to um, Tacoa. I'm going to, St I think it was Stevens County, right? I, I used to know every seat of every county, but I forgot, Stevens County. He said, I'm going to Stevens County, um, and it's obviously a very deep red area, but I want you to come with me because um, I'm gonna test something out. And so I made a beeline up to Stevens County because I knew that Ossoff wasn't done, and I was curious to see what he had to say. And it was there that he made a pitch to the liberal, to the party's liberal core, one that he really didn't make in 2016. 2016, it was a lot about, he started the campaign as a make Trump furious candidate who was gonna run against Donald Trump and kind of be a liberal standard bearer. Um, but really as the campaign evolved, he moved more to the center. Um, but at that moment after he lost, when he went up to Stevens County and was talking to, if you're a Democrat in Stevens County, you've gotta be pretty hard blue, right? It's a very Republican area. It's one of those counties that usually is 70, 80% GOP. In 2017, John Ossoff has this event up in Tacoa, up in Stevens County, and he says what he didn't say on the 2016, uh, doing, the, doing that earlier race, doing the 2017 special election. Uh, he makes a bigger and more concerted pitch for liberal voters, talks about student college debt relief, uh, talks about more liberal issues. And uh, afterwards I asked him what he thought about his message, because it was received very warmly by the crowd there. And he said basically, that might be my path going forward. Um, shortly after, no, around that same time, was another Democrat who was taking the same exact path. That was Stacey Abrams. Uh, Stacey had uh, been a, a major force in Georgia Democratic politics for most of that decade. Um, but at the same time, you know, outside of the, a small clutch of political observers who were closely watching, a lot of Georgians had no idea who she was. And I remember going to an event in early 2017 um, that was her sort of big moment. It was gonna be, she was gonna be the leader of the Trump resistance. And I was really curious, because I knew she was interested in running for statewide office, um, but I hadn't heard her on the campaign trail. I'd heard, I'd seen her uh, very, very often in committee rooms and, and in political events, but I hadn't heard her on a campaign trail. And I was really curious because she'll be the first to tell you, she's an introvert. She is not someone who, who loves the, the attention. She's not very comfortable. It seems like she is, but she's not very comfortable in big crowds. She doesn't like going to grocery stores and getting mobbed by people as she, she's had to grow used to, right? She's one of the biggest names in politics. And one of the things that she said at that event was, uh, I could cry, <laughs> if, I, if I could cry, I would. Basically, she was, she was telegraphing how it's, it was hard for her to show her emotions in the way that she would, she would have to in order to be a, a, uh, a magnetic candidate that she became. It was really fascinating watching her evolution over that year because what she, what the, the philosophy that she pressed forward was that for the last two decades or so before her, Democrats who often ran for office ran like John Ossoff ran in 2017. They ran to the middle. They ran, in her words, as Republican light. Um, Jason Carter is an example of that. And by the way, that was the conventional wisdom back then, right? I mean, Jason wasn't, wasn't, wasn't doing anything that advisors told him um, was wrong. That was what most Democrats in Georgia thought was the key to victory in a statewide race. So when Jason ran for office, he ran with a pledge to expand Medicaid, did not really battle with cultural issues, actually voted for a gun expansion, um, didn't embrace uh, same-sex marriage until the end of his campaign, which was, and that was a huge deal in 2014 at that time. Now it's sort of conventional wisdom, even Republicans have, have gotten onto that idea, but back then it wasn't. Um, Stacey said, I'm gonna run to the left from the get-go. I'm still gonna talk about those issues like expanding Medicaid that a majority of, of or at least polls show a majority of voters support, but I'm also gonna talk about gun control. I'm gonna talk about economic equality. I'm gonna talk about LGBTQ issues, issues that at the time, Democrats were more averse to. And now again, it was not that long ago, it's five years ago, it seems like a long time ago, but yeah, Democrats didn't do that. And I'm also, in Stacey's view, she was also gonna run more towards national Democratic politicians, which was a huge shift. Because in 2014, when Jason Carter and Michelle Nunn were on the ballot, Michelle Nunn was running for Senate, and Barack Obama, the sitting president, came to town, they couldn't be found. 
uh, they were anywhere but Atlanta, where Barack Obama was, was in town to talk about the Ebola virus. Jason Carter found uh, a, a forum to go to that was somewhere else. And I think Michelle Nunn, if I remember correctly, was down in South Georgia visiting peanut farmers. So, and again, no one looked twice, no one thought twice about that because that was the standard conventional democratic strategy, stay away from the national democratic politicians and run towards the party's middle. Stacey Abrams and other candidates in 2018 took a different tack. It was a big gamble uh, running towards national figures, embracing liberal issues. And it almost paid off for Stacey. Uh, she came within a point and a half of beating Republican Brian Kemp, who was the Secretary of State at the time, in an epic election that was the closest in decades in Georgia. But at the same time, even as Stacey Abrams moved to the left, Brian Kemp moved to the right. And he was able to do what she was able to do on the left, on the right. He was able to energize Republican voters with pledges to pass the states the, the most restrictive abortion. Uh, he, he called it the toughest abortion law in the nation. I don't know if it ended up being that. It was close to the toughest when he actually passed it, but, but at the time he was pledging that. He was pledging to adopt the religious liberty measure the Governor Deal vetoed back in 2016. Uh, he was pledging to expand gun access and gun rights me measures, and he was pledging to take a number of other conservative steps that he in fact ended up doing, except for the religious liberty. He ended up accomplishing most of what he carried, he said he would carry out. Um, so he was able to build what he called a red wall in mostly in areas sort of right out Right, right, neighboring here in Northeast Georgia, very, very rural, very, very Republican leaning areas that might have voted 70%, 60% for Republicans in the past, wound up voting 80, 90% for Governor Kemp. He kind of uh, embraced the, the Donald Trump strategy. And of course, that's the other big part of this, is that Donald Trump was one of his biggest allies. Again, it's hard to imagine that, knowing what has happened over the last five years. But I'll never forget that day in 2018, doing the runoff that Brian Kemp was facing, then Lieutenant Governor Casey Cagle. Casey Cagle come in there as the favorite. He had the money, he had the name, he had been basically running for governor for 10 years, he had a lot of IOUs. He came in first in the, in the primary, but couldn't top the 50% plus one you need in Georgia to win it outright, got about 40%. And when he got about 40%, his folks knew he was in trouble, because Brian Kemp came in around 23 or 24%, so pretty far behind him, but Brian Kemp came in with some momentum. And, um, and the other big thing is, Brian Kemp came in with an in with uh, Donald Trump. And when Donald Trump endorsed Kemp six days before the runoff, it was like, you know, a, a switch went off. Kemp was already ahead in the polls, in part because of a secret tape that was leaked to me and a WSB reporter, Richard Belcher, by another candidate who had secretly taped Casey Cagle, uh, talking about uh, a, a, a school voucher, a school, basically a school-related measure that he admitted he didn't want to support, but had to because he was doing it for political reasons. Not a shock to people at the Capitol, but still when you hear someone saying that outright in a secret tape, it, it, it kind of played into Governor Kemp's argument that he always said, I'm the same person I am behind closed doors as I am out in front of the cameras. And when Casey Cagle had that secret tape released, um, it kind of played right into Governor Kemp's argument. So Kemp was already ahead four, five, six points in a lot of polls, but in a way that would never happen now and certainly hasn't happened in Georgia, Donald Trump's endorsement just changed the dynamic overnight you could see the polls flipped, and suddenly Donald Trump was, uh, was I'm sorry, Brian Kemp was way ahead because of Donald Trump's endorsement. He ended up carrying all but two counties in Georgia, um, one in middle Georgia and the other one was Stevens County. Um, so going into that general election against Stacey Abrams, he had a head full of steam, ended up winning by a point and a half, and you know continued to, to tack toward the right. Um, 2020, though, was a completely uh, uh, a different story, uh, because Republicans knew they were on the ropes. They knew with Gwinnett flipping, with Cobb flipping, with Henry flipping, with other counties getting closer, that they had to double down. They had to take a different strategy. They had to either energize their base or move to the middle. And they decided to further energize their base. Um, so as we saw over the 2020 election, um, 
especially with Donald Trump at the top of the ticket. We saw a special election with Johnny Isaacson's uh, this decision to step down early that really became a battle for Trump's support between Doug Collins, the, the then congressman, and, and then U.S. Senator Kelly Leffler that took all sorts of unexpected turns. When Governor Kemp appointed Kelly Leffler to that seat, he was expecting someone who could help win back Gwinnett County, frankly. He was expecting someone who could really appeal as particularly to, to moderate voters, uh, to college-educated white women. You've heard that phrase over and over again because uh, that block of voters has steadily moved towards the left, steadily more, moved towards the Democratic Party. And so when Governor Kemp picked Kelly Leffler, who is not a household name, right? A lot of, I mean, people in the political world had barely even heard of her. Um, but when he picked her as that seat, that was the aim. He was thinking of someone who could help win back suburban voters, particularly women voters, but also be his running mate in 2022, someone who could, who could give him a sort of different image. And instead, because of the nature of that wide open special election with something like 19 candidates running, um, it became a battle between Kelly Leffler and Doug Collins for Trump's support, and Trump was loving it the entire time. It made me, I was getting texts from different operatives and aides the entire time, and it made me feel like I was watching this high school drama play out. Right? Every time Trump came to town, there was literally a fight over who would be on Air Force One with him, who would be in the Beast, which is the vehicle he drives around in the SUV, um, who would welcome him on the tarmac. And you, there was one trip where he made, it was a very quick trip to the UPS headquarters, but uh, UPS facility, not the headquarters, but the facility down near the airport where Doug Collins got to be on the plane, but Kelly Leffler got to shake his hand first when he came out, and they both felt so great about that. They both felt like it was a truce. And of course, again, Trump was lapping it all up. He loved it and didn't end up endorsing either one of them because they were both doing everything they could to appease him. But of course, by doing so, you end up moving further and further to the right and alienating those middle of the road voters. And during all that time, you also had the pandemic where us reporters uh, suddenly were all science reporters. Sports reporters became science reporters. Political reporters became science reporters. So we were all covering, and for instance, for me, I was covering this campaign from my basement, you know, back before there was rallies. Um, as it began to open up a little bit more though, my kids were still, my kids went to DeKalb County Public Schools, so they were still stuck at home. And my wife works at Emory University Hospital, so she was at work every day. And so I dragged them on the campaign trail with me. Um, and it was a blast because they, my daughter, my, and she's now 12, she was I guess nine or 10 back then, but she started something called Blue Steam Blogs where she made these video blogs every day. And you have, you know, it's this cool thing about being a reporter, especially before all the, all this intense national attention, but you have access to the candidates. And so they were able to interview on Blue Steam Blogs, my two kids, all four of the Senate runoff candidates. The first was Ossoff, who at the time didn't have a kid. Now he has a, a young daughter. Um, but he had just been, he was just married and wasn't all that familiar and comfortable with little kids. And so we were somewhere in Decatur and my daughter interviews him and says, what any kid who at that time would say, which was there was almost a billion dollars was spent during that campaign, most of it on really bad ads. And everyone, I know everyone in this room who lived through it was tired of it. We were tired of it. My daughter was especially tired of it. And so she asked John Ossoff, what's with all these terrible ads? Why can't you stop them? <laughs> and Ossoff answers in the most Ossoffian way, going into a long soliloquy about McCain, Feingold, <laughs> campaign finance reform. My daughter looks at me, she's like, I He's saying, and in the background, one of John, one of Ossoff's aides is shaking his head and going, "I don't know, you know, that's just that's just Senator Ossoff." Um, the next interview he got was actually she got was actually here in Grinnett at the at a park nearby, um, where it was Senator Warnock, then you know just Reverend Warnock, um, and uh, she she my kid asked Reverend Warnock, you know, what makes a pastor able to run for office? What, what positions you to be a, a politician better than a doctor or a lawyer or anything else? And he looked at her and he goes, it's a lot better question your dad has ever asked me. <laughs> uh, the, the next one was David Perdue um, down in middle Georgia. And my daughter was still stuck at home because as, as most of you guys know, and 
your kids and grandkids, it took a while for them to go back to, to regular school. Uh, they were still doing virtual school. My daughter was sick of it. And so she asked David Perdue, uh, what's your stance? Should kids be going back to school? And David Perdue gave a very David Perdueian answer. He got down on one, new, one knee, looked her in the eye and said, little girl, what do you think? <laughs> it, he did not want to give an answer. And the last one was Kelly Leffler was out in Carrollton and we were at, a, we were at a, a bar where she had a campaign event and we went behind the scenes in the little room and there was one other local reporter with me and so I asked whatever lame question I had to ask for that day's story. Um, the other reporter asked whatever question she had to ask for that day's story and my daughter asked again Kelly Leffler, um, what's with the terrible campaign ads that we've been inundated with. And as my daughter was asking the question, one of those ads came up on the background of the TV. And Kelly Leffler, being Kelly Leffler, gave a very Kelly Lefflerian answer and went into how radical liberal Raphael Warnock was a radical liberal. <laughs> but that race, uh, that race was an epic race, the billion dollars spent, a game-changing race for Georgia, um, one that it's hard to say that it will completely change the fabric of this state going on because it was a one-off, right? Um, it was, Georgia flipped in that cycle. Um, but it was also because of extraordinary circumstances, the pandemic, protests for, for, for racial justice, which I go into in detail in the book, um, and of course the Donald Trump effect, where, and. This was one of those moments because the entire campaign I'm talking to, you know, I'm one of the rare people who, and it's just because of my position, where you're, you're talking to all sides. I am constantly talking to Republicans, Democrats, Republican operatives, Democratic operatives, um, oftentimes, including during this past election, when a candidate wants to concede, they don't even know the other candidate's, you know, cell phone number, so they're asking me for their cell phone numbers. So this happened with, uh, with, with Raphael Warnock and Herschel Walker um, when, uh, when Herschel's campaign just a few weeks ago, I guess it was, decided, or a few months ago, said it to concede. They texted me saying, hey, can you give us you know, the other guy's phone numbers? And of course I do, um, because you know, I'm just facilitating it, I guess, in that effect. But I'm talking to folks the whole time, and I'm hearing on the ground from Republicans saying, we're going to lose this because our supporters aren't going to show up. Uh, they're, they're, they're believing those falsehoods about this conspiracy theories about election fraud. Um, Kelly Leffler's campaign even had a file called GOP not voting. It was a file of tens of thousands of names that they didn't even bother calling because they, they, they had already written them off as such hardcore either Trump supporters or believers of the election fraud that they decided it wasn't worth their time to go after those voters. And I first thought that was a little bit of overblown, overdramatic. But then I went to an event not far from here in Wills Park in North Fulton, Alpharetta, right? You guys all know Alpharetta. It's not, um, it's an affluent suburb. It's, it's not necessarily a very deep red enclave. In fact, it had flipped blue also in 2016. And I had run cross country there as a, as a high schooler, so I was very familiar with it. And the event, I think, was at two o'clock. And so I showed up, I thought, you know, it was this Stop the Steal event that Lynn Wood, Vernon Jones, and some other uh, far right Trump supporters were holding. And I was going to go just because I was curious. Um, and I showed up, it was at 2 o'clock, I, I think I drove up at like 1.55. Because I thought, okay, maybe there might be 50 people there. There was uh, 1,500 people there. I couldn't find a parking space. By the time I parked, got to the event, um, it was a madhouse. It was a zoo. There was uh, people packed this little equestrian rink where they were having it. And one speaker after another was saying, not only the election was stolen, but they were, there was one, Lynn Wood in particular, was actually advocating because when 1,500 people showed up in Alpharetta and they were listening to speakers like Lynn Wood who were not only saying lock Kemp up, but he was saying, don't vote. Don't vote. And as, as I, afterwards, I kind of camped out kind of near the parking lot and I interviewed more than a dozen Republican Trump supporters. And I couldn't find a single one who would affirmatively, authoritatively say that they were going to vote in that election. Um, they were, uh, most of them either said they don't trust the system or they were still up in the air about whether to vote. And that was my wake up call too. That this, this stop the steal stuff was more than a blip in the radar. And of course, Donald Trump ended up coming down twice doing that runoff. And both times he spoke for about 90 minutes from a, to a crowd of tens of, you know, in, in one case, tens of thousands of people. In other, uh, down in Valdosta, it was thousands, but up in, um, up, it was Dalton, it was probably 20,000 people. And both times he was there to try, uh, purportedly, to promote Kelly Leffler and David Perdue. 
And both times he talked about them for about two minutes of the 90 minute speech. And instead most made the rest of his remarks about his election grievances, and not about them. And to say that they were frustrated is an understatement. <laughs> they were furious, right? They, they, they were banking on Donald Trump to help put them across the finish line. And instead, he barely talked about them. Um, so when the election results came in, first uh, Warnock um, had a, a clearer victory than, than, than Ossoff, that he had a bigger margin. Ossoff's race was already, always going to be tougher. One of Ossoff's strategies is really interesting because he knew that Raphael Warnock was ahead, in the, uh, ahead of him. They weren't ever going one-on-one, -on -one, but he knew that he, Raphael Warnock had a bigger base of support than, than, than John Ossoff did. So he made every single one of his TV ads during that last nine-week runoff period. It was, every single one of them was targeting black voters. He knew that was his biggest weakness. Um, it was a gamble. I mean, no less than the Senate Minority Leader uh, warned him. Chuck Schumer warned him that, hey, if you do that, you might risk some of your white support, your white liberal support, your swing voter support in the suburbs, all that. He knew it was a risk, and he said, we're going to be watching that, and if our numbers start to dip with them, we'll change our strategy. But he knew that appealing to African-American voters, the backbone of the Democratic Party in Georgia was his number one priority. And through those ads, a lot of them were about COVID relief funds. A lot of them were about the promise to have $2,000 checks um, that many that many Georgians ended up getting uh, in early 2021. Uh, a lot of them are about economic quality and healthcare access and other issues that are near and near to everyone. Um, but he, they were particularly tailored at black voters. And that helped. And that race was called a few hours after the other race. But by the time we woke up, on January 6th, 2021, um, the, the dynamic was that the Senate control had flipped to Democrats. And the story of the day was going to be that Democrats won control of the U.S. Senate, and now it's going to help bolster President Biden's uh, incoming administration. Of course, by the end of that day, that was the below the fold story. Um, because over the next six or seven hours, we saw the insurrection, the, the riot, the mob, whatever you want to call it, at the Capitol, which changed everything. Kelly Leffler had gone into that after promising at that last Dalton rally to object to Joe Biden's victory in Georgia. And instead, she had a last minute change of heart where she decided um, pretty much 20 or so minutes as she was hiding in the basement of the Capitol cafeteria not to go forward with objecting to the election. She knew also at the time that it could come back to haunt her, especially with Trump supporters. She had spent the entire, since getting appointed by Governor Kemp to that office, she had spent the entire time cozying up to Donald Trump, trying to sh show her loyalty. And even at that last rally, there was concerns. This was just two days before the election. She was concerned that Donald Trump would somehow withhold his support and say, maybe vote for her, or, you know, hedge like he does. And so that's why she decided to announce at that rally that she was going to indeed block, vote to block the, the, uh, the, the confirmation of Joe Biden's victory in Georgia. And then she had that change of heart as she was hearing protesters you know, above her swarmed the Capitol as she was watching the news, um, seeing Twitter, the devastating reports about the violence and carnage at, 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 at the Capitol, decided not to. Now, in hindsight, she'll say now that she did so because it was a foregone conclusion that Biden would win anyway, uh, that Biden would get the, you know, the Electoral College confirmation and she didn't want to delay the process. But at the time, um, it was just this uh, obviously a traumatic moment and uh, she was she was willing to move on That brings us to the 2022 campaign, which I touch on in the book But of course the book was finished before um, Before all, a lot of that happened and it's amazing to think back because around that time in t early 2021 Governor Kemp looked like a sitting duck you had Stacey Abrams with a ton of momentum who could credibly claim a big chunk of the credit for Georgia flipping blue. She had built the framework. It was sort of her revenge, in a sense, of her, vi her, her narrow defeat to Governor Kemp. She was able to have, in her words, catharsis, you know, this, 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 uh, this moment where two years after her devastating defeat, um, she could claim a big portion of the victory. And then you had Donald Trump's outspoken opposition to Brian Kemp at that point. During that whole nine weeks, Donald Trump was not only pressuring Kelly Leffler and David Perdue to take more and more and more aggressive steps to help him. But he was also going after the governor, 
the then Lieutenant Governor Jeff Duncan, the late House Speaker David Ralston, and other Republican leaders to call a special session and overturn the election results, um, to reverse the, uh, the uh, confirmation uh, of, of the Electoral College returns in Georgia, and to take other steps like somehow invalidating the election results. Um, Kemp, Ralston, and Duncan quickly agreed there was no way to do that, not only because it would be illegal, and that was, of course, the first concern. It, was, it would cause ceaseless litigation. Uh, and to their credit, they, they, they quickly established that it was illegal. But second of all, they knew that had Georgia's capital been turned into a special session to, that would presumably and predict, you know, maybe a vote to overturn the election results, it would have put the 236 lawmakers under the Gold Dome under unbelievable pressure that they'd never felt before. It would, and it would lead to protest and, and potentially violence that we saw uh, of the scale we saw in Washington at the Georgia Capitol. So they quickly um, uh, agreed not to do that, but it meant, it meant repercussions. It meant repercussions for Secretary of State Raffensperger, of course, whose wife was faced with horrible, I mean, he was faced with death threats, his wife was faced with death threats. She got text messages calling her all sorts of vile, horrible names. Um, at one point, protesters went to what they thought was his house. Instead, they, they went to some random guy's, poor random guy's house up in Alpharetta. Um, a motorcycle gang, imagine a motorcycle gang uh, uh, circulating outside what they thought was Raffensperger's house. Instead, it was just, you know, someone else with a similar name. Um, Jeff Duncan had to have a security detail, um, was faced with all sorts of death threats. His son, who was active on Twitter at the time, was also faced with all sorts of death threats. And Governor Kemp, of course, is used to it in a sense. Doesn't make it okay, but he was used to it. But what he wasn't used to was his kids. And he has three daughters who he always talks about. And one of his daughter's boy, uh, boyfriends, unfortunately, was killed in a tragic car accident in, um, in South Georgia on the same day that Mike Pence was to give a big rally. And as I was down in Savannah waiting for Mike Pence's rally, got the call that the, the governor would no longer be there and got the call saying it's not because of any Trump-related controversy, it's, it's because of a tragedy, you'll know more in a second. And as I got that call, I got a call also from uh, a top aide from Stacey Abrams, who told me, in a rare occurrence, right? You know, they don't usually act together. But she asked me to warn Governor Kemp's staff about what was happening online. And what was happening online at that same moment were vile conspiracy theories from the far right saying that Governor Kemp was somehow involved in the death of his daughter's boyfriend. Terrible stuff, right? Um, and so I remember not long afterwards, Governor Kemp was one of the first people he wanted to do a televised uh, getting a vaccine televised to show everyone that it was okay to get vaccinated. And he had a press conference shortly after. And we asked him all about, you know, what happened. And he went off script because he then, instead of talking, he did talk about the vaccine, but instead of continuing to talk about the vaccine, he talked about how infuriating it was to see these people, presumably in his party, who were supporting him in 2018, um, who, were support, who supported the ticket in 2020, suddenly in early 2021, um, go so far as to accuse his, him and his family uh, uh, of, of this vile conspiracy theory of being complicit in, in that tragic death. Um, I think that was also a sign for Governor Kemp that he was gonna, um, he was gonna make a clean break in a sense. And as Donald Trump continued his rhetoric, continued to attack Governor Kemp, Attorney General Chris Carr, Re Secretary of State Raffensperger, other Republicans for not doing enough to overturn his election. Um, and of course that infamous phone call with Brad Raffensperger happened January 2nd or 3rd, I can't remember exactly the date, but right before all this, this election, um, Kemp, Kemp had a decision to make. There were people around him who were telling him not to run, that he was a sitting duck, as I said earlier, um, that if another Republican didn't knock him off, Stacey Abrams surely would. He was getting booed at Republican rallies. At the state Republican convention two years ago, was it two years? Yeah, it was two years ago. Um, he was almost booed out the room. There was applause too, but there was very, very, very loud boos. Uh, and that wasn't the only thing. I mean, I, pretty much every Republican rally I went to, I went to one with Marjorie Taylor Greene up in Rome, and he, not only was he booed, he was heckled. People were screaming at him, telling him to get off the stage. Uh, he, he, he did something that I've never, really, ne really never seen a politician do. Um, afterwards, he stayed at that rally and at the Republican convention, and pretty much every other time he got booed. And he asked, he wanted to speak to everyone who booed him. And he said, come up to me, you know, 
tell me why you're booing me. Tell me why you're, I'll, I'll answer. And he could tell his wife, Marty, was frustrated. She wanted to leave, right? I don't blame her. Um, but he'd patiently talk to each one of those people and, and try to answer their concerns, their questions. I don't know if he did. I don't know if there is any way to answer all those concerns. But I think that helped him kind of establish that framework that, and that resolve to run again. Because he was getting advice from a lot of people not to run again. And at that moment, Donald Trump's endorsement seemed like a golden ticket. I mean, the memories of the 2018 election where Donald Trump's endorsement helped power him to this overwhelming victory were still fresh on everyone's mind. And it wasn't just in Georgia. Trump's endorsement uh, was seen all over the country as this sort of this calling card, as this glide path for Republicans who got it to, to easily, easily, easily win the nomination, if not the general election. Um, and his decision to run, even against David Perdue's challenge, uh, it changed the dynamic in Georgia in a sense. Um, of course, Trump uh, Kemp ended up winning by 52 points, but that was not a foregone conclusion. What, what Brian Kemp resolved to do over the last year was use every lever of power to win. And you can't blame him. I mean, that's, that's why you're in power. And if you're a governor and you use that power uh, uh, effectively, it gives you a huge leg up. So he was able to pass a, pass a range of legislation that moderates like, like t bonuses to teachers, uh, $2,000 pay raises to teachers, things like that, and also the conservative love. Um, one of the last things that, w w that was passed in last year's legislative session was very, very controversial, even with Republicans. The Speaker of the House, David Ralston, hated it. He was very against any sort of legislation that would ban transgender girls from competing in high school sports. A, he didn't think it was that big of an issue. And B, he was worried about the mental health effects that that would have on young women, um, young transgender girls. Uh, but in the end, he told me he decided to support it because it would help Governor Kemp's re-election campaign. Uh, there was other issues that Governor Kemp passed last year uh, with, with the support of Republican legislature, including a huge expansion of gun rights and other measures. And he made another a, a number of other moves, including... Um, uh, appointing Sonny Perdue to be the chancellor of the Regents system with the help of the Board of Regents, which he appoints. It was a year-long battle, but it effectively, effectively took one of David Perdue's biggest allies off the playing field. Because no longer could David Perdue point to his first cousin, one of the most popular Republican governors in, in, in Georgia history, and also one of the only Republican governors in recent Georgia history. He can no longer point to him for support. He could, he could then kind of neutralize that effect. And of course, what we saw was a 52-point victory from, from, from Brian Kemp, and going into a general election where he never trailed Stacey Abrams once, because of that, he, was ne he never really had to make a host of big campaign promises. He could kind of give more modest uh, campaign promises, whereas Stacey had to give, you know, f felt, felt like at least, she had to make a host of uh, literally 100 different promises, from expanding Medicaid, legalizing casino gambling, um, uh, g new gun control legislation, uh, economic equity, um, all sorts of different proposals. Where got Brian Kemp, you know, he might have had five or six ma major ones. Um, what else happened when that election, beyond the Senate race, was that Governor Kemp also was able to basically nullify the Republican Civil War. Because after his 52-point victory, his standing in polls among Republicans was like 95%. So he didn't feel like he had to go. There was this big concern that a really drawn-out battle between him and David Perdue would, would, would cause this deep schism within the GOP. He quelled the Republican Civil War and was able to focus on the center. And if there was, and, and, and to kind of close out before I take questions, if there is a theme, if I said earlier the theme of 2018 and 2020 were both parties moving towards their flanks, towards their bases, what we saw in 2022 was the candidates who could most effectively claim the center were the ones who won. Certainly Brian Kemp was, was at least could make an argument that he helped claim the center. Um, there are a number, a huge number of voters who were very concerned about his policies on abortion, guns, religious, you know, conservative uh, culture wars issues, you name it. But who also liked his stance on the economy and his stand against Donald Trump. In the Senate race, we saw an even sharper clash where um, Senator Warnock very early on, very early on, realized his best path to victory was one going to the middle. He certainly didn't run away from his liberal voting record. He voted with Joe Biden and other Democrats on pretty much every major issue. But he also talked more about working with Marco Rubio, Tommy Tuberville, uh, Ted Cruz on the campaign trail than he did about working with President Biden. In fact, 
when President Biden's name came up, it was often uh, on the uh, from Warnock. It was often about uh, opposing him on plans to close military installations, on uh, not going far enough to relieve student debt, on, on other issues, and so. Warnock realized his very narrow path of victory, because as bad of a candidate as Herschel Walker was, and objectively he was not a good candidate, right? Uh, I, I don't think Republicans, even in his campaign, would, would quibble, quibble with that. Um, but still, you had a number of Republican supporters of, of, of Herschel Walker who, no matter what, were saying either they didn't believe some of the negative attention, or they did believe it, but it didn't matter to them because he would still be a reliable vote for the Republican caucus in the states and the U.S. Senate. And to many voters, that's, that's, and frankly, there's a lot of Democrats who would say the same thing about a not so great Democratic candidate who might be on the ticket. Um, so with that calculus, Warnock realized he had this very narrow path and that he could afford very little <laughs> screw ups. Um, and so he walked that line. And so when he was on the campaign trail, he would say he wanted to support uh, Biden's priorities without saying Biden's name, but he would also talk about that bipartisanship. And, you know, there's a narrow group of voters in Georgia who are willing to vote as a swing voter, two or three percent. But in Georgia, that two or three percent makes a huge difference. So 200,000 camp backers did not back Herschel Walker in that first round of November voting. 200,000. So most elections, that would be a couple percent, but the Republican would still easily win. But with Warnock on the ballot against Walker, that was enough to put that race in a, in a runoff. And in the end, the last nine weeks, there's this remarkable um, dynamic where Democrats were actually talking about Brian Kemp supporters who were willing to vote for Raphael Warnock. It was this bizarre, uh, the bizarre, bizarre effect. Whereas Herschel Walker's campaign continued to go to the to the far right. Um, his opening message to voters was also often about transgender sports, which I understand is important to some people, but. It might not be their top priority when the economy, when the, you know, you name it. There's a lot of other issues. And a lot of Republicans were calling me saying, what is he doing out there? Um, and in the end, it was those swing voters, those centrist voters, I think, who ended up being the defining difference uh, for Raphael Warnock's campaign in November 2022. Uh, before we take questions, now we're going into 2024 election campaign where we have two, three maybe legitimate national figures. Brian Kemp could very well be um, on the short list for anyone not named Donald Trump if they win the nomination. It does look like Donald Trump is the front runner right now, so uh, he will not be Donald Trump's running mate, I can promise you that. And Kemp is out there saying Republicans need to look forward and not look back. So he's, he's, he's adding his voice to the chorus of Republicans saying move on from Donald Trump. Uh, Raphael Warnock has run five races in the last two years and has come in first in every single race. He's raised more money than a lot of presidential candidates. Uh, he won the two most expensive U.S. Senate races in the nation's history. And if you don't think he's a, he's a presidential candidate in 2028 or 2032, you're fooling yourself because uh, I don't know if he'll run, but he's certainly going to be in the mix. And the third national candidate is Marjorie Taylor Greene. It's impossible to under, underscore her impact. She is She's raised more money than a lot of U.S. House candidates have raised. She was one of the top fundraisers this last cycle. She raised, uh, she, she, uh, only Nancy Pelosi and a few other people raised more money than she is. She's a national name brand and she's a hero to many on the far right. And if Donald Trump is the nominee, there'll be serious talk about her being his running mate. So we've got a lot of action going on in Georgia, uh, but I'm really interested in your questions. I, sa I said I'd talk for like 30 minutes, I ended up talking for about 45, so sorry, but I wanna, I'd love to hear your questions. Thank you. Have you got any questions? Yes, ma'am. You do this job so well when you clearly don't enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. I love this job. It, it's, it, again, it's been my dream since I was in the fourth grade. Uh, and I've always wanted to work for the AJC. And I, had, I have ink in my veins in a, in a bit because uh, my cousin Eleanor Ringel was the f film critic for the AJC for a long time. Uh, my grandmother is Marjorie Ringel, so we have, we have uh, Eleanor is my mom's first cousin, and I think she's one of my brother's godmo godmothers. Um, and I've just always wanted to do it, and it's fun. And um, as someone, I was speaking at a KSU class just a couple days ago, and they asked me, could I see myself doing something else? And I really, I really can't. 
you know, and we do have this, sometimes I have to pinch myself because I'm sitting at an event and, you know, right before this, I was, it never ends, right? It never does. And my kids are used to it, but it never ends. And even when I was at my kids' playoff tennis match two days ago at, uh, here at Best Friend Park, she was playing playoffs for her middle school, Peachtree Middle School. I was dealing with, you know, your regular stuff because it never ends. Um, but I think you have to love it to do it because these days it's podcasts, it's blogs, it's newsletters, it's all that stuff. Um, but it's so much fun covering all the ins and outs and twists and turns of Georgia politics. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. So this is a what if question. Yeah, a what if question. Yes, what if. What if John Ossoff had had to run against Herschel Walker? Yeah, what if John, that's a good question. What if John Ossoff had to run against Herschel Walker? You know, I think we're seeing a signal of what it would be like right now. I think he would take a very similar strategy as, as, as Raphael Warnock did. Right now, what is John Ossoff talking about? We're not hearing about it as much because we're still a ways away from 2026, but he's talking about working with the Republicans. I wrote a story about this a couple of weeks ago where I quoted, I think it was Grassley, Senator Grassley, a very, very conservative Republican, singing John Ossoff's praises for a bill they had together, an opioid uh, addiction, I think it was, or it might have been a military aid. It was something like that, you know, that it's bipartisan, it's consensus driven. So right now, Ossoff is trying to plant the seeds of that same strategy. Now, it's going to change because three years is a long way out. And who is John Ossoff's most likely opponent right now? I think it's Governor Kemp. Um, I think you're already seeing some of the opening skirmishes between those two when it comes to economic development messaging and, and other things that are out there. Um, for instance, tomorrow I'll be down in Peachtree City for a big hearing that Republicans are holding on the economy. And uh, right before this, I tweeted out a letter that Governor Kemp sent attacking, uh, attacking Ossoff and Warnock over that. Ossoff has probably already sent the letter back while I was standing up here. So we're already seeing some of those skirmishes, but I think he's going to go for the middle, the middle ground. Well, let's say he goes for the middle ground. Yeah. Then there's the African-American community and the other groups that are now in Georgia. I mean, that's a very, that's a tightrope. It's a tightrope. He'll also have a very important ally, Senator Warnock who he calls a brother from his other mother, right? They're very close, and it's not just for show. You know, sometimes their campaigns can have, you know, back and forth, because that always happens. But the, those two are very close, and I wouldn't say Warnock will be a secret weapon, because he's not secret, but he'll be an important, important ally for him, especially with the black community, um, but beyond. And, you know, as, as Warnock becomes more of a national figure, uh, he'll be able to help raise Ossoff, raise money. Not that Ossoff needs that much help, because Ossoff is right behind him in terms of fundraising. He's a fundraising dynamo himself. And that's why Ossoff is, is, if, if, is so, so long as he can continue winning, he'll be talked about as a presidential candidate in the 30s. Seems a long way out. But um, folks who know him really well definitely think he has higher aspirations as well. Yes, sir. Uh, I used to be an independent voter, but that was 20-something years ago. But, but the question I have, is that Americans don't seem to take to take much, make attention take attention to the press and, and women that he that, that he you know fathered mm -hmm. children with and it didn't make any difference and, and Trump all the the bad press that he gets he's still the, 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 the he's still leading the Republican Party how could that be Yeah the question was about uh, all the accusations about Herschel Walker that came out. Um, uh, about uh, infidelity, about violence against women, about abuse, uh, you name it, right? They were reported up upon even long before he even ran for office and vetted and double-checked and deemed to be accurate that Herschel Walker, you know, either didn't address at all or said was false. Um, and it was why Republican voters or why certain voters, um, uh, uh, you know, aren't alarmed by that. And what we, what we found in our reporting and in just talking to scores of voters was basically Republican, basically, Republicans in that race could be put into three big, huge, narrow blocks. One was a big chunk of voters who didn't believe any of it, who didn't hear it on Fox News or in conservative media and uh, thought the mainstream press, or even when conservative outlets might have reported on it, that it wasn't true. Uh, 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 an equally probably big block were Republicans who thought it was true, were concerned about it, but still voted for him because um, they were they wanted a Republican vote in the U.S. Senate. And I, 
said it earlier, there's plenty of Democrats who would probably feel the same way if Democrats had a candidate with that many flaws who said, who said that, you know, a Supreme Court vote was, was all important to them or, you know, Democratic policies were above all. But then there was that small group, but a significant, and, and it turns out to be the de decisive vote of a group of voters who were concerned about that and who couldn't stomach voting for Herschel Walker. And that was Senator Warnock's biggest allies in the, in the, in the, in the, in the final stretch of the race, 200,000 or so voters who, maybe it was even more, um, but we could, we could pin down 200,000 or so who didn't vote for, for Walker but voted for Kemp. And those were the voters, and many of them are, are up here in the suburbs, but many of them are beyond, who ended up um, swinging the election. Yes, sir, back there. Uh, yes. Uh, so I'm uh, just cu I'm, uh, curious. As far as uh, how you project uh, 2024 and 2026, uh, one may say that you know Georgia turning blue in 2020 was a fluke mm -hmm. because of uh, Trump being a president. As uh, president, then uh, do you think uh, the trend for Georgia will still uh, be to continue to be a purple uh, slash swing state, yeah. or will it be like, hey, this was like we were only blue because of Trump, and when, if you get a more, uh, maybe not traditional Republican, or yeah. maybe a Republican who knows to uh, uh, keep quiet. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if you had a more mainstream candidate, would Georgia be, uh, would, would be less competitive? And I think the answer is probably yeah. Right. Um, if Chris Carr was the Senate nominee instead of Herschel Walker, we might be talking about a Republican clean sweep. We will never know, but we might be talking about that right now. But the fact is the fact, which is Democrats uh, lost every other statewide race except for the Senate race, and they swept the statewide races in uh, in 2020. And you know, and I'll I'll take that cue from Republicans themselves. You know, uh, 10 years ago, Republicans would laugh at the idea that Georgia was a battleground. They'd say it's a red state, it's not a purple state, or anything else. And now. It's hard to find Republicans who say Georgia's not going to be competitive. And no less than Chris Christie, who ran for president in 2016 and is the former New Jersey governor, he said yesterday on a podcast that Georgia's so important to Republicans this year that it's a must win. That if, Georgia, if Republicans don't win Georgia, they might as well write off the election because there's no way they can win without Georgia in the red column. So that gives you an idea of what we're about to face here in Georgia because we had a billion dollars in spending. I don't think it'll be a billion dollars, but it might be closer to 500 million uh, like we had about uh, in the 2022 election because both parties are going to expend unbelievable amounts of resources into winning Georgia. And it might have been an anomaly. It might be more like fluked in, uh, in 2024 than, than flipped. But it was so, you know, it, it's the, fact of the, the, the facts on the ground still point to a very, very competitive election cycle. Yes, ma'am. Uh, where do you see Stacey Abrams going in the future? Yeah, the question is about what Stacey Abrams would do next. And I, poll, I did an unscientific sort of survey of, of about 50 or 60 Democratic officials, elected officials, party leaders, and activists. And it was, I was, it was hard pressed. I found a few, but it, it was hard to find anyone who said they wanted her to run a third time. Um, some, a few did, um, but not many. Um, she said she might run again, but she's also already getting involved in other, in other areas, other realms. She joined an electric vehicle advocacy group. She's teaching at Howard University in the upcoming semester. Um, she's still writing books. So I think she's taking it easy right now. Um, and there's frankly, there's, you know, three or two or three years ago, she was the de facto party leader. Now there's others. Nakima Williams has come on the scene since then. She wants to be the next U.S. House Speaker, and I don't. No one, no one counts her out because Nakima Williams is a force of political nature. Um, and of course, Senators Warnock and Ossoff are now, you know, national figures in their own right. So, I, I don't count Stacey Abrams out. There's a lot of Democrats who feel like she's on the ballot. She wins the primary um, because she's Stacey Abrams. Um, but there is a. There's a new group of Republicans, I'm uh, sorry, of Democrats who are waiting in the wings. Some of them we've heard before, uh, Bean Wen, Jen Jordan, they could run again for statewide office. Lucy McBath would be a very, very, very formidable candidate for, for governor. And I can tell you Republicans are already thinking about Lucy McBath running for governor in 2026 um, because she would be, uh, she would bring a different element to this. So I hope that answered your questions. And I think we're getting the sign off. Um, two questions. Oh, we got two of them. Did you ever learn to type? I did learn to type. Mavis Beacon, 
taught me 60 words a minute. Second question, you've told us a lot tonight. Is there a lot more there's, still in your book? There's a lot more still in the book about the personalities and the people and the dynamics that makes our state such a wonderful place to be if you're a political junkie. Yes? I have a totally different question. I'm very concerned because I love the agency. Yeah. Are you really going to stop even making a print edition? And are you going to stop the home delivery? Because Yeah, that rumor got out there um, last year, and I can tell you that n even even our highest ranking executives were surprised by that because they hadn't heard that news. So uh, there are no plans that we've been told whatsoever to stop printing the, the paper. Our deadlines are earlier. We've made changes, you know. Um, less, less breaking news can get in because our deadline's a little earlier, so you're not going to see as much sports coverage. But we have something wonderful called the E-Edition as well. And you can literally look at the entire newspaper online, on your phone, on your tablet, wherever, on your computer, and flip through it. Yes. So, yep. So, yeah, we are still continue printing the print paper. Do we have time for one more? Let's take one more. Okay. Is there a case to be made for Marjorie on the national ticket? Is there a case to be made for Marjorie Taylor Greene on the national ticket? You have to ask Donald Trump that because he, if he gets the nomination, you'll see a lot of reporting suggesting her as his running mate. Um, he doesn't want Mike Pence, we know that. Uh, he would love to have a woman to help balance the ticket. Um, and Marjorie is, is, she is a political force herself. She raises a lot of money, she gets a lot of media attention, she enrages a lot of liberals, but at the same time, every time you know, we write a story or someone writes a story about the shocking, outrageous thing that she did, which is almost every day, um, there is a number of Republicans who also get mobilized and energized by that. And so, um, and in the end, I don't think she'll be anyone's running mate, but I think she'll be talked about it as such. And frankly, I think that she'll be talked about as a statewide candidate in Georgia, 2026 and beyond. So uh, <laughs> my first encounter with her was at the Alon's coffee shop in Dunwoody. And, and she was framing herself as sort of a conservative Republican, but not a firebrand. And you know, I meet all sorts of candidates all the time, so I kind of said, okay, we'll watch you. She was going to challenge Karen Handel, right? She didn't look like she had any chance. And then it's amazing what little decisions have big impacts. And when Tom Graves up in northwest Georgia decided to step down, she said she knew she had no chance to challenge Karen Handel, so she imported her entire campaign operation to Rome, Georgia, and, you know, kind of won that race in a walk. So, and now we've got, that's the situation we've got. So. Um, yeah, I, I, we're going to keep our eye on her. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay, last one. Uh, I was going to ask, how has your approach to like journalism and news changed with the uh, a lot of allegations of fake news and the stuff with Fox News? And how, how is that affecting Yeah, how fake news is affecting our jobs. Um, and you know, I have friends, just last night I was at downtown Dunwoody area and one of my friends was like, fake news, you know, just joking around. But it does, it, 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 there's a significant amount of the population that will never believe anything that the AJC does, uh, that they don't like. Any, any story they don't like, they'll just say fake news. And part of that was propelled by Trump, but part of that was long before that. There was all, there's been a distrust in the media for a, lot, a while. And so the way that we at the AJC try to counter that is just accurate, credible, timely information about the issues that, that matter to us most. Uh, in my job, I'm constantly, literally, unfortunately, constantly in contact um, with folks from all walks of political life, right? Republicans, Democrats. Just today, I've, I'm sure I've talked to 30 or 40 people without even going out of my way and trying to do so, because that's part of the job. And that includes Ossoff's team and Kemp's team, right? Kemp's, Kemp's top aides and Ossoff's top aides, who I've talked to multiple times today. And it's not even a big, it's particularly busy news day, right? Knock on wood. Um, so, so we do our best. You know, we're not always perfect, but when we're not, we try to fess up to it. Um, I, I, I don't like surprising sources. So if I have a big, ne bad negative story coming, I'll let them know. I'll give them a chance to respond to it. Um, and again, you show your face too. Like, if I have a bad story, I do my best. If I have a negative story about someone, I do my best to show up and see them in person the next day uh, so that it doesn't seem like I'm hiding away from them, um, that I'm out there active. And so that's why I'm going to Peachtree City tomorrow. And that's why I'll be all over the campaign trail because it's already starting back up. We, we're, there's little rest for the weary here in Georgia. 
Well, guys, thank you so much for having me. I've got over time, but I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank Greg, uh, Greg, excuse me, for his insight and uh, for the interesting and informative presentation tonight. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, it's your interest in programs like this sponsored by the library that, that makes us want to continue them. And we appreciate your being here tonight. Uh, Greg will be available to sign the books that you bought. And um, I'd like to remind you all, if you haven't already, to pick up uh, a brochure on future library events. Most of the events in May will be virtual events and the library does request that you uh, register at the library website for them. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in the future at events like this. And I'm going to ask Greg to, uh, to draw the door prize. And real quick, and since I'm a millennial, quick selfie. <laughs> <laughs> Karen Adler. <laughs> Thank you all again. Thank you.